going to read for us from verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I say to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Only so far may the Lord bless the reading of His Word. The title of our sermon this morning is, it comes from verse 50, from verse 50, I've added these words, by faith you will see greater things. By faith, you will see greater things. So I've applied those words of Jesus that he says to his disciples, you will see greater things than these. And he does say these words to his disciples because the you here is not in the singular form, it's in the plural form. So as he's speaking to Nathaniel, he's not just saying this on the benefit of Nathaniel, but to all of his disciples, you will see greater things than these. And it's based upon the faith that Nathanael exhibited by declaring Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen these things you believe, I say to you, you will see greater things. And as his disciples who are gathered around him, they are the ones who believe that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. We've even seen this in the previous section when Jesus calls the first disciples. It wasn't really so much as the ESV puts it in the heading there. Jesus calls the first disciples from verse 35. We've looked at that passage and we've seen that it is more a case of John the Baptist proclaiming this is Jesus. There is the Lamb of God. And when he declared, behold the Lamb of God in verse 36, we see two disciples going and following Jesus. And Jesus, turning to these two disciples, he asked them, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? And they don't answer him in accordance to tell him what they are seeking. But they put it in a way as if they have found what they were seeking. They say, Rabbi, where are you staying? As if to imply, we have found you. We want to know where you reside, where you stay. And then in verse 39, he says to them, come and you will see. You've noticed now the same words was used by Philip when he called Nathanael. When he expressed, can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said to Nathanael, come and see. He extends the same invitation that Jesus extended to the two disciples, Andrew and John, the gospel writer. So in verse 39, we see they came and they saw where he was staying. And in verse 40, we see one of the disciples, this was Andrew, going to his brother Simon. And then he says to Simon, we have found the Messiah. We have found the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus giving Simon a different name, Cephas, or calling him Peter, which is the rock. And then the next day, we find Jesus deciding to go to Galilee. 
Here is the first instance then in the Gospel of John where we see Jesus coming to seek a particular disciple. He goes and he finds. He finds Philip. You see, Philip was not seeking for Jesus. But Jesus was seeking for Philip. And he found Philip. And he said to Philip, follow me. You see, the other disciples followed Jesus based on the proclamation of John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God. And here Jesus saying to Philip directly, Follow me. Now this is the case of many of the disciples even today. Some disciples come to the Lord Jesus Christ because they heard the proclamation of the gospel and they come based on the proclamation that they've heard that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and they've heard the preaching and they follow Jesus. Some disciples come to Jesus because they read the scriptures and they look at the invitations by Jesus, something like they might find here in verse 43 where Jesus says, follow me. Or they read something like Matthew 11, where Jesus says, Come to me, all who are burdened and heavy laden. And then through the reading of the scriptures and the prayer of their hearts, O oh Lord, Jesus, save my soul, I wish to follow you. They then devote themselves to the word of God and the Lord leads them and guides them to himself. And so in verse 44, when we see, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Interesting that John, the gospel writer, thinks that this is important information. It seems to be so irrelevant to the story. Why would it be relevant to tell us that Philip and Andrew and Peter is from Bethsaida? We saw later on that when Philip found Nathanael, he said to him, Jesus of Nazareth. So here is somehow a... a connection with the cities and there's something going on here so let me open it up for you a little bit why Bethsaida later on in the gospels especially in the synoptics later on in the life of Jesus in Matthew 11 verse 20 to 22 we read that Jesus pronounces a judgment over the city of Bethsaida so do you think Bethsaida is a good city to be from do you think that's something that folks brag about being from Bethsaida I think that's not something that good folks brag about. Matthew 11, verse 20 to 22, we read, Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes, but I tell you, it would be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Luke 10 verse 13 to 14 records the same event. Now immediately in that verse, then the image comes up of the Old Testament, especially where Abram prays for the Lord to spare the righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so in this verse, what we read then, if you read the names Philip, Andrew, and Peter, you read of the righteous that was spared of the judgment over Bethsaida. We read of God preserving His righteous, preserving His disciples, even in the midst of much wickedness and of judgment being pronounced. And this is the comfort for us as the disciples of Jesus. Isn't it our comfort? To know that as the disciples of Jesus, God has called us out of this world to be disciples of Christ. So that we may be spared the judgment that is upon this world. That we may be spared of the wrath of God that rests upon the unrighteous, the ungodly, and the wicked. So that we may be the righteous ones of God. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And so it's ironic then when we read in verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of God. And then we have this response in verse 46 by Nathanael. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Bethsaida? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Asked Nathanael. And Philip, instead of quibbling with him in verse 46, we find him just 
The simple invitation, come and see. How well wouldn't we do as Christians, instead of bickering with unbelievers about you don't believe these things, we believe these things, and how can you not believe these things, and bickering with them over theological points, why not just ask them, come and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you come to the Lord yet? Have you tasted His Word? I mean, really tasted His Word? You can't tell me that you found His Word lacking in certain aspects or that there's not enough evidence to support. Have you tried? Have you tried putting your trust in the Lord? Have you tried keeping some of His commandments to obtain some of the blessings? Doesn't Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us, without faith it is impossible to please God? And those who would please God must believe that He exists, but not just exist, but believe that He rewards those who seek Him. That He rewards those who seek Him. So, I challenge you to seek Him and to have His rewards come to you. Because then you will know. An unbeliever will not be converted because you had a wonderful intellectual argument bullying him into Christianity. They've had many Christians try. They are hardened against that. They have all their defenses up. But to challenge them to come directly to God, to taste and see, come and see, come and you will see. It's an echo of Jesus' own invitation to the other disciples in verse 39 when he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and they saw. They have their eyes opened when they meet with Jesus. You see, unbelievers are not converted because they had some interaction with Christians. Unbelievers are saved because they had interaction with Christians who sufficiently pointed them to Christ the Savior. Pointing away from ourselves to the Lamb of God. Pointing away from ourselves to Jesus, the one who can save. Now pay attention back to verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, listen to this confession of faith of Philip. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. These disciples of Jesus had an expectation, an expectation built upon the Old Testament scriptures, Moses and the prophets. And their expectation was of one to come. And now Philip says, we have found. It's ironic that he says we have found while it was Jesus who found him. You see, when Jesus finds us, we find him. So that the reward of those who seek come to some of those who don't even seek but are sought by God. You see that the blessing comes to Philip because Jesus sought him and found him. So because Jesus found him, Philip also found. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. So Philip also had an expectation based upon his understanding of the Old Testament. He did have an expectation. He did seek the one of whom Moses and the prophets spoke. And so he was seeking for Jesus. And he did find him whom his heart so desperately sought. But you see, we cannot find Jesus if Jesus does not make himself known to us. Philip found Nathanael then and said to him, we have found. So you see a lot of finding going on. One disciple finding another, finding Jesus, finding one another. And part of the truth expressed here also is that when we find the Savior, we find our fellow disciples. When we find Jesus, we find also the people of God. Like our membership class this morning. You cannot claim to have union with Christ if you don't have interconnectedness with His disciples. If you have communion and fellowship with the body of Christ, with your fellow disciples. 
Now, when he says we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, he's referring possibly here to Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, because all over the Gospels we read of this expectation of a long-awaited prophet that would show up. So Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, God says to Moses, and Moses says to the people, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. When Peter in Acts preaches in the temple to the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders, he says in verse 22 of chapter 3, Moses said, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And he makes the connection and says, Jesus is that prophet. Stephen, the deacon of the church, in his sermon before his death in Acts chapter 7, verse 37, said also, this is, the, this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Now, it's important to note that Philip here says it's the expectation written in the book of Moses, in the law of Moses, and also the prophets. Collectively, all of the Old Testament points us to Christ, Philip says. And even at the end of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says the same thing to his disciples in verse 44 of Luke chapter 24. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So Jesus confirms their faith, which they exhibited in the beginning of the Gospel of John, that the things written in Moses and the prophets point to him. Now, just a brief note here. At some point during the ministry of Jesus, when John the Baptist was put in prison, John the Baptist sends disciples to Jesus to ask this question, Are you the one or shall we look for another? What was the response of Jesus to the question of John the Baptist? Jesus quoted the Old Testament prophets. Tell John, this is what you see. And so Jesus answering by the words of Scripture, I am the one. I am the one. The Scriptures are pointing to me. Why would John the Baptist ask this question? You see, the great tension in the Gospels. The great tension in the Gospels is the Jewish misunderstanding of the Old Testament. Why were the Jews blind to Jesus? Was it because the Old Testament insufficiently pointed out Christ? Or because the Jews, the religious leaders, misunderstood the Old Testament scriptures? You see, and I put it to you this morning, this is what Jesus comes to show his disciples. That from the Old Testament, that they should understand the Old Testament scriptures in the way that God intended them to be understood. So that there would be no misunderstanding. You see, in John 5 and verse 39, Jesus tells the religious leaders of Israel, he tells them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. You think that in them you have eternal life. And what are the things that they pay attention to in the Old Testament? The things that they pay attention to are the things. But what is Jesus telling them they should be paying attention to? And it is they that bear witness about me, he says. The Old Testament does not point us to various things, not to the things of God, but to the Son of God, to Christ, to the Messiah. And so this is what Jesus is contending for. You search the Scriptures because you think that they give you eternal life, but they don't give eternal life apart from the one whom they are pointing to. 
So as I've said before, you can approach the Scriptures. You can approach the Scriptures in a way in which you miss Jesus. You miss the salvation promised in the Scriptures. And you miss God. But you cannot come to Christ. You cannot come to God apart from, apart from these Scriptures that point to Him, that reveal Him to us. That is why we must be diligent in our searching of the Scriptures. Not just the New Testament. Oh, you who say we are New Testament Christians. It's fine. You can be New Testament Christians as long as you read your New Testament and go back to every single Old Testament quotation. Because I believe that they will sufficiently point you to some of the Old Testament passages and you will see. And you will start to see Christ in all of the Old Testament. All of God's word was given to his people to sufficiently point them to the Savior. And so, Philip exhibits this faith. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. As Daniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? There's not much said in the Old Testament about Jesus being from Nazareth. And so, Nathaniel is probably recalling I don't recall any prophecy being of significance about Nazareth. So is there anything good coming from Nazareth? There was one prophecy saying he will be called a Nazarene. And so Philip just says, come and see. Come and see. Now let's look at verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him. This is just wonderful to read. Nathanael coming. Philip said, Come and see, and he's responding. Nathaniel coming toward him. So Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him. So now Jesus opens the dialogue and says to Nathaniel, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. What a greeting. What a greeting. An Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Jesus was not being sarcastic when he said this. Jesus is saying, here comes an Israelite who is good in his heart, who is open-hearted, open to the things of God, in whom is no deceit is found, not a double-hearted, not a double-minded Israelite. What's the implication when Jesus greets Nathanael in this way? Indeed, an Israelite in, deep, in whom there is no deceit. What does it imply about the other Israelites? It implies that they are deceitful. Just like he was asking, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He was doubting the good of Jesus coming out of Nazareth. And now Jesus is not doubting the openness of this man's heart coming from Israel. Can you see the irony at play here? An Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Indeed an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. This reflects on some of the history of Israel. As you'll note, Jesus quotes in verse 51. He doesn't quote, but he alludes to something that happens in the Old Testament. He says, indeed, you will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Where does that point you to in the Old Testament? Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder in Genesis 28. So have in mind Jacob here, because this is now the link. Indeed, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Who was first called Israel in the Old Testament? Jacob. What does his name mean? Jacob is the deceiver. Jacob the deceiver had his name changed when he met with God. And he wrestled with God. And God told him, you will no longer be Jacob the deceiver, but you will be Israel. The ones who strive with God. The one who wrestles with God. Now Jesus is greeting Nathanael and saying, An Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. 
an Israelite who truly reflects the change that took place in the life of Jacob when his name was changed. Implying that the rest of the Israelites still have the nature of Jacob, their forefather. Implying that Israel still needs salvation from her deceit. Now we truly understand when Jesus said, I came to seek the lost sheep of Israel. But Israel didn't believe that they were lost sheep. That was the problem. That's why they rejected Jesus. We are not the lost sheep, they thought. We have been found. And sometimes we can make the same mistake if we think we have been found. What we oftentimes find is that we are self-fulfilled, self-righteous, self-satisfied. So when Jesus greets Nathanael, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. We recall the words of Genesis 27 and verse 35 when Isaac says to Esau, your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. Your brother has come deceitfully and he's taken away your blessing. Even Jacob's sons, we read in Genesis 34 verse 13, the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. And so you see throughout the deceit of Israel. Indeed, the question is almost put as an implication. Can anything good come from Israel? Can anything good come from Israel? Nathaniel then responds in verse 48. He says to Jesus, how do you know me? How do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. One of the implications here is before Nathaniel came, and saw Jesus, Jesus saw him even before he was found. Isn't this the marvelous truth of salvation even? We don't even know our own lostness. But while we are in our state of lostness, while we are in our state of not knowing, while we are in our state of desiring more of the knowledge of God maybe, God already knows us. Jesus already sees us. And his wonderful willingness to reveal himself more and more to his disciples. To give more and more of himself to us. And so Nathaniel responds then to this divine insight of Jesus when he says, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Jesus reveals to him, in other words, that he is this Messiah, the Son of God who is come. And indeed, Nathanael knew that he was the Messiah because Philip already told him, we have found him of whom Moses and the prophets spoke, the Messiah, the Son of God. And so then now Nathanael responds with his own confession of faith, much like the confession of faith of Peter, Confessing his faith directly to Jesus. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Then Jesus responded and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? So he's saying is it, it's, it's wonderful to find faith in this person who upon this little bit of revelation, exhibits such faith and exhibits such a confession of faith. And then Jesus promises him, and indeed the promises to all of the disciples. But here it's given to Nathanael in verse 50. You will see greater things than these. You will see greater things than these. There's a promise to those who exhibit their faith in Christ, those who confess their faith in Christ. You will see greater things. 
You imagine that you've seen the best of Christ? Do you think that you've seen the best that Christ can do? Some Christians confess their faith in that way. I had a religious experience when I was 12 or 13, and ever since then, I never had a greater religious experience. It's unhealthy. It's troublesome. It's worrying. Based on the promise of Christ here, you will see greater things than these. By faith, God will build upon your faith and upon the things that you see and experience of God's goodness to you. You have not seen the best of Christ. Definitely not when you were 7 or 12 or 13. Great as those things may have been at that time, Great as those things may be, don't for a minute think I'm questioning the legitimacy of what happened. But what I am saying is there's more. There's more to come. Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And then he said to him, truly, truly, this is the first time in the Gospel of John that we have Jesus saying these words, truly, truly. They correspond with the Old Testament prophets who used to say, Thus saith the Lord. Jesus now proving himself to be the final prophet, not needing to say, Thus saith the Lord, but truly, truly, I say unto you. Truly, truly, I say unto you. Speaking the authoritative word of God. And when Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he's about to make a very important statement. We need to pay attention to it. How many of us read over the statement and think, oh, don't think much of it. Truly, truly, I say to you, and this is you all. And I think if we are disciples of Jesus, it applies to us as well. You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, where do you think the disciples of Jesus saw this? Jesus promised they would see this. Jesus promised his disciple he would see this. If you read through the Gospels, where do you see the heaven opened? Where do you see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man? I put it to you that this is not speaking of one singular event. I put it to you that this is speaking of the glory of Christ that is revealed to us all throughout the Gospel at various stages. And I put it to you that when you see it here, you expect to see more of it in the future. And when you see it in that instance, you expect to see more of it in the future. So some have pointed to various places. This is talking about Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain where his glory was seen by the three disciples. Well, Nathaniel wasn't there. Then it's talking about his ascension, some argue. And some even put it way further and argue that it's with his second coming. I think, brothers and sisters, we can safely say it may be referring to all of those events. Because the truth here spoken of is not so much to point us to a future event of the glory of Christ, but to reveal to us what our eyes can take in at this moment. The present glory of Christ that we can see. And we must confess that the glory of Christ that's put on display is way more than we can take in at this moment. But the promise for us as disciples, which is here, is that you will see more of it the more you exhibit faith and trust in the Lord. That's the promise for us. By faith, you will see greater things than these. Whenever you think I've seen the fullness of the glory of Christ, wait, there's more. Because your eyes and your mind and your faith cannot yet take in all of it. That's why we need to grow in our faith, grow in our sanctification. And that's why some theologians of old have said, if there's no desire for holiness, there is no desire to see the glory of God because it's only through that progress in sanctification and holiness 
that there'll be more of God's glory to be seen. Do we really desire to see the glory of God? Or are we content to remain blind? This is echoing, this is starting the echo of what later is echoed in John chapter 3 and verse 3 when Jesus speaks to Nicodemus. He says to him, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice the same opening, truly, truly, I say unto you, if you take these statements together, truly, truly, I say unto you, you will see heaven opened. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What's the implication? What is the implication of this? That when he makes this the promise to his disciples, he's making this promise to those who have been born again, you will see. You will see. Later in the same conversation, he says, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, in the first stage, you're just seeing the heavens opened from afar. But as it progresses, will not enter into the, you can enter in. There where the glory is radiating from, you get to stand one step closer and see more of the glory coming in. It's like when you're standing afar off and you can see over oh, there on the horizon, there's a little tree. And then when you go a little bit closer, you start seeing, oh no, that tree is not just a little tree, it's a big tree. Then you go closer and closer and closer, and then you see more of the glory of the tree as you progress closer. And we know that we cannot see these things unless God opens our eyes, the eyes of faith. Matthew 16 and verse 17 when Peter confesses Christ, Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. My Father who is in heaven revealed these things to you. In Matthew 13, verse 10 to 11, we read the following. The disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? When Jesus was preaching in parables, they asked him, why are you speaking in parables? He answered them, this is to his disciples, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. What Jesus is saying through the very same proclamation of the word, through the very same parables that I publicly proclaim, Those who have been born again will know and see the promises contained in them. And others would make it out as useless. The same preaching producing two effects. One effect to salvation in the people of God. And one bringing greater condemnation to those who refuse to believe the word of God. And who determines who will respond in which way? Not, not, it's not up to me. It's not up to the one preaching. It's up to you, the listener, to ask yourself and to come before God and say, Lord, have I really received this? Have I really received this? I really desire to receive this. I really want to be diligent in receiving these things. Later on in Matthew 13 and verse 14 to 17, Jesus said, Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. 
Christian, be careful of wishing that you were in the olden days, in the days of Moses, in the days of the prophets, in the days of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus says. He contradicts you here completely. Many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see. You look at them and you think how lucky they are. They look at you and say, how blessed are you by the Lord. How blessed are you. For they long to see what you see. Can you imagine? Abraham wishing to see what you now see today. Isaac wishing to see what you see today. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. Wishing to be able to sit here with you and see what you see by the grace of God. Just to close with verse 51. When Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This evening we will come to Genesis chapter 28 and we'll look at that event in Jacob's life when he fled from Esau and how he is in a place where there is nothing and he has to erect a stone to lay his head upon. And when he lays his head upon the stone and he falls asleep, there God appears to him. There God appears to Jacob, the deceiver, the one who is fleeing for his life from his brother. And he sees this glorious vision of the heavens opened and the angels ascending on des and descending on a ladder. And he calls the name of the place. He, re he erects that stone, he puts it up and he anoints it with oil and he calls that stone Bethel, house of God. What Jesus is saying, in other words, when he's alluding to this, you will see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus Christ is the ladder between heaven and earth. He is the true mediator. He is the only mediator bridging the chasm between heaven and earth. But he is also Bethel. He is also Bethel, house of God. This is where God dwells. So that when the disciples and the apostles later preach in the book of Acts and they continually ask this question, shall God live in a house made with hands? Does God live in a temple made with hands? The answer is no. God dwells in his son Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. God dwells in the Christians by the Holy Spirit. The church is being built up into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So that we as the church today embody some of the glories of what Jesus is speaking about here. You will see heaven opened. And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Do you see the angels ascending and descending? Do you see the work that Christ does on behalf of even of this local church. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glories of Christ that we can see through the Scriptures, that you have given us the eyes to see by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that as we look at the work of Christ, even in our local congregation, that we would see more of the glory of Christ as he ministers to us. Thank you, Lord, that you have revealed these things to us who are your disciples, that we by faith may see these greater things. Thank you that we have this promise of even seeing greater things in the future. Even as the disciples here who have passed from this life and who are with you in heaven at this time await the resurrection in which they will receive their glorified bodies in which we all will see more of the glory that is expressed even in this verse. Even as it is revealed to us in the book of Revelation as we see the heaven opened 
and the heavenly city of Jerusalem descending upon your new creation. Thank you, O Lord, that Christ is the mediator, the bridge between heaven and earth. That we may stand upon him and be assured that we have fellowship and communion with our God. Thank you for your grace and favor toward us in his name. Amen.